Hello everybody, welcome to The Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today, I'm talking about the new album from William Orbit, The Painter. Well, here's a name I wasn't expecting to get the chance to talk about. Uh, William Orbit is a fairly well-known British producer, uh, probably best known for having produced Madonna's Ray of Light album in 1998, alongside various other remixes and collaborations behind the scenes for artists ranging from U2 to Blur to No Doubt to Beth Orton to Britney Spears and more. But he also has a fairly substantial and generally well-reviewed solo catalog as well, including a series of experimental down-tempo releases called Strange Cargo, and a couple of classical rework albums called Pieces in a Modern Style, among other things, including being part of the band's Torch Song and Bassomatic. I myself first got into his solo work many years ago without any clue that he'd worked with so many high-profile artists. Around 2014-ish, I'd been intrigued to look into him, obviously already being a huge fan of Orbital and The Orb. I thought, hey, maybe this other artist with a name that isn't too far away from those and who also broke out or around the same time, actually a little bit before them, uh, maybe that'll be up my alley as well. And while uh, William Orbit didn't turn out to leave even close to as much of a lasting impact as those other two, which is to say he didn't become one of my literal favorite artists of all time, I do remember quite enjoying everything I heard from him. Every now and then I have felt the urge to go back and listen to something of his, even though it's admittedly been a long time. And when I heard that he had an entire new solo studio album, his first in eight years, I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to catch myself up on his work again and refresh all my memories. So I went back and listened to all his previous solo studio albums, and here's my thoughts on his discography so far. Right, so we're starting on a bit of an odd, non-indicative note. A fairly straightforward synth-pop project from 1987 with guest vocals on nearly every track from Peta Nikolic. Uh, I never bothered with this one back in the day since Orbit himself has publicly disowned it, calling it not his best work and really only worth the time of completionists. But listening to it now... Okay, I can kind of see where he's coming from, but I wouldn't say it's that bad. It's more, like forgettable and excessively dated than anything. There's one cheesy reggae-ish track called Feel Like Jumping that kinda sucked, and a weird country-ish track that Orbit sings on himself I don't really know how to feel about, but outside of that, it's a perfectly serviceable selection of late 80s synth pop. Nothing essential, but it's got some decent tunes. Okay, but here's where the interesting stuff starts. Released in the same year as his debut, this is the first in a series of all-instrumental, semi-experimental down-tempo albums that I remember spending a decent amount of time with in my early college days. Like his debut, it sounds extremely 80s, but it explores a lot more different textures and ideas ranging from cheesy but hard-hitting 80s electro-funk to Latin fusion to tranquil ambient material and a couple of stranger and more abstract cuts that give off strong Tangerine Dream vibes. Much of it has a slight New Age-ish feel and can sound like the soundtrack to some old Animal Planet TV show, but for what it is, it's plenty of eclectic and well-varied fun, still holds up as well as I remember, very solid stuff. True to the title, it's another round of material like the first Strange Cargo, all the same down-tempo grooves and eclectic ideas as before, and as you might guess from its 1990 release, it's he's starting to move his very 80s sound into a few more textures that sound a bit more 90s. Although, this one wasn't quite as strong or consistent as the first volume. Like, for every stronger cut, like the bright and lively Latin tinges of Dia del Muerto, the disorienting, mildly African or Indian-inspired sounds of 777, the dramatic ambient cascades of The Last Lagoon, or the more tranquil meanderings of Millennium, there's another cut that is just kinda there and doesn't leave any strong impact. Beyond the whole, it's generally fine, but it makes a bit for a bit of an underwhelming sequel. But then this third volume saw a lot more success than either of the previous two, mainly off the promise of the single Water From A Vine Leaf featuring Beth Orton, which uh, became a pretty big hit in dance music circles and is probably Orbit's most well-known solo track. It also helps that this was probably his strongest solo album up to this point. Still very down-tempo oriented and background music-y and still very much a product of its time. Also ran on a bit too long for its own good. But I do prefer the excessively 90 sound of this album over the 80 sound of the previous albums. And while Water From A Vine Leaf is the best track by far, the rest of the album is really solid too. The combination of early 90s house and breakbeat styles with lots of ambient dub and new age stylings, featuring occasional world music and influences put it in similar territory to artists like Enigma and Bel Canto. 
Probably the William Orbit album I've most frequently come back to over the past couple of years. That and another one I'll get to later, which will not be the one you'd expect. Alright, and there was one more fourth volume in the Strange Cargo series that he released under the alias Strange Cargo instead of under his own name, but still frequently gets classified as one of his main studio albums anyway. I hadn't heard this since 2014 and didn't remember anything about it, but as it turns out, it's more stuff in the same vein as Strange Cargo 3, and about equally as enjoyable too. Maybe even a tiny bit better. There may be no big standout on here that hits the same heights as Water from a Vine Leaf, but it's a lot more consistent and engaging than I remembered it being. It can definitely hit if I'm in a sounds from the ground kind of mood. Now this is probably his most well-known solo project, a collection of synth reinterpretations of classical pieces which was more successful than anything else he'd released previously, reaching all the way to number two on the UK album charts at the time, also propelled by remixes from Ferry Corsten and ATB of his interpretation of Barber's Adagio for Strings. It was well received at the time, but seems to get mixed reviews from audiences nowadays, especially from classical music enthusiasts who really seem to hate it for feeling really rote or dumbed down or something like that. I remember generally liking it back in the day as a classical music non-enthusiast. Coming back to it now, it's fine. Some of his reinterpretations are fairly plain and just play the piece as is on contemporary ambient synths. Some get a little weirder and take more liberties with remixing the pieces. The whole thing tends towards the very tranquil and ambient side of his sound with lots of liquid beatless pads that fulfill more of a Brian Eno type niche. I don't think it's an especially interesting listen or an example of his strongest work, but it's suitably relaxing. Getting back to his albums of original material, he's not naming them uh, Strange Cargo anymore, but he's still very much operating in the same light and esoteric but mildly danceable downtempo territory. Nothing you wouldn't already expect from him at this point, but it's also probably the first moment in his catalog that doesn't sound like a fairly obvious product of its time. Unequivocally sticking to a sound he can call his own without leaning on sound or production cliches of the time it was released. And I would say this is another one of his strongest efforts so far. Like the last album, but maybe a bit more up-tempo and dance-centric on average and ever so slightly less light and fluffy. I really don't have much to say about this one, and I think it's solid enough. I, I wouldn't put it among his most memorable efforts, though. Next up is the sequel to Pieces in a Modern Style, covering even more very classical pieces in his usual manner, once again switching off between playing the pieces fairly straight and taking even more creative liberties. It's not talked about nearly as often as the first volume, and as far as I can tell, it wasn't received nearly as warmly by fans or critics either. So, uh... Is it weird that I thought this was actually better than the first one? Like, the first volume was much more of a straight ambient project, the kind of thing you could fall asleep to. This one feels like it's working the classical compositions into Orbit's usual style more with some brighter dance and downtempo grooves underscoring these cuts. It sounds like more of his own thing while still clearly showing his passion for the genre. I mean, once again, I have seen classical enthusiasts calling it irreverent, like a watering down of pieces that don't seem to convey any appreciation for the craft of classical music beyond the surface level feel of it. And uh, I am not in any place to tell you how accurate such claims are as the dirty plebeian non-classical fan that I am, but it sounds pretty reverent to me. And like it's delivering what it says on the tin. Not gonna say it's a front-to-back masterpiece, there are a few less interesting moments here too. The Pier Gint remix was kinda goofy, uh, also I have previewed through the bonus second disc of remixes and alternate cuts which sounded a fair bit cheesier and like the complaints I'd seen were more on point. That Carmen remix was awful, Jesus Christ. But as far as the main core of the album goes, I enjoyed the whole thing for what it was, this is not harming anyone. And while we're on the topic of classical music, I suppose it was only a matter of time before Orbit decided to come up with some original classical music of his own and release a full-on symphonic album. Perhaps unfortunately this isn't available to legally stream or download anywhere anymore. Uh, it used to be a free download exclusive to his SoundCloud page, and it's since been taken down. Even more of a shame because, bizarrely enough, this is actually my most listened to William Orbit album, and it's not especially close either. I remember being absolutely mesmerized by this album back in 2014, how it switched off between pieces that were really beautiful and tranquil like the first cut and other pieces that were nothing short of complete unhinged chaos. Hello part 5A. I loved how well detailed all these pieces were, and how many cool instrumental ideas they marched through and bounced off each other, how much dynamic range it all had, and how it felt like he was making use of every single individual player in the orchestra. And it even incorporated some occasional electronic elements in there pretty well too, like how parts 5C and 1B rebuild earlier pieces out of Orbit's usual synth tones. 
Not to say I don't have my issues here, either. Uh, a few cuts can kind of meander on or aren't as interesting. And the 15 movements in this so-called suite don't tend to connect to each other. The whole thing can occasionally feel kind of clunky and disjointed. This was always an album that I would often be in the mood to just listen to specific tracks on, but rarely played out in its full entirety. There were definitely moments here that got way more attention than others. Part 8 especially comes to mind with all those pianos in the beginning. So good. It feels really weird for me to mark such a non-indicative detour in his catalog like this as my favorite William Orbit album. And it's kind of hard to recommend, especially given the complete lack of availability, but I've got a lot of good memories attached to this one, and it felt like it operated on a level of depth that none of his other projects ever did for me. Maybe it's the nostalgia bias, but I think it's a legit great. Oh yeah, in the same year as Orbit Symphonic, he released another free download album on SoundCloud that also got taken down and isn't available anymore. But this was his first entry into the Strange Cargo series since the 90s. The Photoshoppy album cover there might not exactly inspire confidence, but it does generally reach the same standard of quality as the other albums in the series, taking his usual eclectic and breezy down-tempo stylings and a few of the leftover classical influences and filtering through some more modern-sounding digital production. Not as good as Strange Cargo 3 or Hinterland, uh, n better than 2, um, slightly worse than 1, but about on par with that one. Which finally brings us to here. Man, did I have a lot more to say than I thought I was going to. <laughs> yeah, uh, William Orbit is definitely an artist I have a strange relationship with. Like I said, he has never been one of my all-time favorites, and I don't think he's ever put out, like, a full album that I would call truly revolutionary. Maybe some of the Strange Cargo albums from the 80s were kind of ahead of their time in defining the creative directions of the chill-out scene in the following decade, but it's more common for his music to feel a little dated by today's standards and cater to trends at the time. Not so much by the 2000s and onwards, where he'd eventually settled into his niche and ran with it, more so his stuff in the 80s and 90s that were allegedly pioneering. But at the same time, even if he doesn't have much that I outright love, he doesn't have anything I dislike either, and not much that even dares to fall towards okay. He is an artist that operates pretty much entirely within the 7 range. I feel like he can be consistently relied upon to put out solid material on the border of dance and chill out music. I do have a lot of good memories listening to his stuff in my early college days, and he was just as good as I remembered him being coming back to his stuff for this video. But that brings us to this latest album, again his first in 8 years, and his first actually get decent promo in 12 years. Uh, seemed like it was going to fall more within the lineage of his albums like Hello Waveforms and My Oracle Lives Uptown. A real proper album and not a detour side project. Got a lot more vocal guests than usual, some of the ones you'd expect like Beth Orton and Lori Mayer from Torch Song, who've been behind the scenes on lots of William Orbit albums in the past. But we also got Katie Melua, we got Ali Love from The Chemical Brothers Do It Again, we got Georgia Barnes, who uh, just appeared on one of Gorilla's most recent cuts. We got Lido Pimienta, who just worked with Orbit on his recent Starbeam EP that I did a Some Stuff I Missed segment on. And some other vocalists that I am admittedly less familiar with. Oh yeah, and two of the tracks on this newest album are retooled cuts that originally appeared on Strange Cargo 5. Uh, being I Paint What I See and The Diver. I wasn't really sure what to expect out of this, but I figured I would probably generally like it. There's not been very much buzz for this project that I have seen. No one's requested it, and I myself only knew it existed thanks to Fela having remixed one of the pre-album singles and tweeting about it. And what little buzz I have seen for it is that it is in fact a new William Orbit album. Although I haven't seen anyone actively trashing it either. But after hearing it myself... Yeah, it's pretty good. One of his better efforts in a while. A bit scattershot at points, and not every track goes over as well as the next, but it's all generally likable. I'd say maybe it's about on par with Hello Waveforms, a, a little weaker than that one, but pretty close to that level. I mean, some William Orbit albums can run together or just feel like background music, but this one doesn't have that problem as much. Every track on here feels like it has something unique to bring to the table while all adding up to his usual light and fluffy down-tempo and trip-hop-ish style here. It's an album that both sounds like its own thing in the greater context of his catalog, while also kind of summing up pretty much all the feelings I've ever had on his work. Going through individual tracks, the album starts out pretty dang strong in its opening stretch. Opener Duende with Katie Malua certainly lets you know what you're getting into in its liquid mix of airy vocals, guitar arpeggios, and synth strings adding up to a very bubbly and laid-back vibe that sets the tone for everything that will follow. Really dang solid tune on top of that. 
And Bank of Wildflowers features a similar instrumental palette, but some very different energy thanks to the much brighter and more upfront performance of Georgia, alongside some much crisper and more synthetic drum machine textures that hit a fair bit harder. I Paint What I See is almost entirely different from the version that appeared on Strange Cargo 5, aside from Beth Orton's half-whispered monologue. Although, the original cut wasn't one of my favorites from that album, and this instrumental is a fair bit stronger, with its mysterious plinging piano chords, humming, deep air-style bass lines that occasionally appear over a stark and minimalistic, almost trap beat, I guess. Much more engaging than the original version was, in my eyes. And Heshima Kwa Hukwe is a major highlight as well, featuring lots of African vocals from the late uh, Hukwe Zawose, Sorry for butcher pronunciations as per usual. And stretching out for eight and a half minutes, exploring lots of soothing melodic percussion textures, various other African-inspired instrumentation, alongside some very dub-heavy synths. Doesn't sound quite like anything else in Orbit's catalog and had my attention pulled in through its entire length despite not having a ton of progression. After this point, though, the album does get a bit spottier with some cuts that maybe don't pull me in as much. Nuestra Situación uh, features some solid Spanish vocal performances from Lido Pimienta and lots of very pretty layers of instrumentation ranging from guitars to pianos to synth strings and whatever else. But it's all going over this really stock set of reggaeton percussion that comes off really cliche, makes the track feel like it might be making a push for something more radio friendly, even though I can't imagine William Orbit getting a lot of radio play in this day and age. The Diver with Natalie Walker is the other cut retooled from Strange Cargo 5, although instrumentally this one is pretty much identical to the original, and the only difference is replacing Lori Mayer's wordless harmonizing with Walker's more standard vocal performance with actual lyrics and stuff. And not gonna lie, I would say this version is a step down from the original. Uh, the track doesn't feel uh, nearly as spacious without the vocal harmonizing, and Walker delivers some monologues about disappearing into a field of wildflowers that... and they kind of give the whole track a, like a goofier, almost new agey kind of feel that I'm not as crazy about. Colors Colliding is a pretty decent ambient-centric tune with lots of warm layers of pianos and synth organs and strings, Really does a good job of nailing that cozy and intimate feeling it's going for on an instrumental level, though I'm not as crazy about Polly Scattergood's vocal performance on this one. She doesn't quite feel like she fits in the mix as well as some of the other vocalists here, her lyrics get a little repetitive. This was always a cut I wanted to mark as a favor, but just wasn't totally feeling it in any of the moments she was actually singing. The other vocal cut that particularly stood out to me as being not that great was Promethean Lies. I felt like the instrumental on that one just kind of blended into everything else on the album, aside from some dubby synth chords here and there. And the vocal performance from Ali Love was just not my thing at all. Not just the shalala vocals, which are eh, but his voice just kind of feels weak and grated on my nerves a bit in a completely different way from the way he graded on me when he worked with the Chemical Brothers that one time, mind you. I wouldn't have guessed it was the same singer as Do It Again, and it's not even close to being the same unrelenting, <laughs> mind-destroying earworm that that cut is. This cut is just kind of meh in a really unspecific way, and it's the one track I'd be most likely to want to hit the skip button on, but I don't hate it either. But the second half of the album does have more highlights than not, mostly the instrumental cuts that don't have any featured guests at all. Gold Coast has all these lively and warm layers of guitars, pianos, and wiry synths that were quite a bit more attention-grabbing and mood-brightening than many of the tracks that came immediately before it. Second Moon is one of the most expansive and atmospheric cuts in the bunch, with its uh, synth pads, piano strings, and sitars really evoking that sense of wide open space, while all the thumping percussion and occasional high-pitched synth soloing gives the track a bit more energy. And Planet Sunrise is a major highlight as well, starting out all ambient with lots of plinking synths going up next to warm Vangela style pads and uncredited female vocal harmonies. Though halfway through it picks up this really driving bass arpeggio that almost gave the track a Paul Van Dyke kind of feel without ever bringing any drums in. That one might be my favorite track here, if not exactly be by a wide margin. The album also ends with two more fairly serviceable vocal cuts that were neither major favorites nor major low points. No Other World carries on the wide open spacey vibes as the track it immediately followed, albeit also focusing on more guitars, much slower and more thunderous and epic percussion patterns, and some kind of meandering monologues from Beth Orton that are all right, I guess. This track didn't really do much for me initially, but it has grown on me every time I've put it on. 
honestly kind of wish the album ended here after enough listens since it does uh, particularly feel like the kind of cut that would work really well as a closer. But instead we finish with Free Glow, which I suppose isn't a bad way to go out either. The occasional filtered vocal performances from, I think, Gloria Caba are a little distracting and take away from the track a bit for me, but the more energetic pulsations and spacious synth mixes going up next to the wordless harmonizing from Lori Mayer does just as good a job of creating the emotional vibe that the whole album has been going for. I won't exactly say we're finishing with a bang, but it's about as good a place to finish as anything else here. And that's everything on The Painter. Album's pretty solid, I will say. I suppose the focus on vocals isn't going to be for everyone, and some of the performances were a little hit and miss, but even in the least interesting moments, this whole thing tends to have that sort of, like, early 2000s commercial trip-hop sort of feel to it that I quite enjoyed and I think uh, helped set this album apart from the rest of Orbit's catalog. I doubt this album is going to be, like, blowing anyone's mind, but it is an all-around very pleasant and well-varied listen that's excellently produced as to be expected. I have seen some reviews complain about the length, but I don't think it ever drags on too much. Between all the elements of this album that I really liked and those that didn't really interest me, we have an album that feels like it hits the exact average level of personal enjoyment that I get out of William Orbit's work. I liked it a fair bit. If you were curious about it, I think it's worth a shot. I'll give this a very strong 7.3 out of 10. But of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters, they're awesome people. You want to add yourself that list, link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.